Hello there guys, RMP792 here. Uh, yes, I know my hair looks weird, I'm getting it cut later, and, well, frankly, my barber does a better job if I haven't gelled it up, so, flat hair for today. So, uh, let's talk Star Trek Discovery. We are up to episode... six, I think? Yeah, six sounds about right. Um, it's the one with Saru's home planet. This is actually a pretty good episode of Star Trek Discovery, well done. Um, once again, the stuff that works about it is they focus on a central plot, it's an interesting premise, and it's focused around a character. And I think at this point we can all agree that Tilly and Saru are very much the MVPs of this show. Um, just in terms of, you know, they are... You know, uh, Doug Jones in particular is absolutely knocking it out of the park this season with, with these emotional scenes. And let's be honest, that's not easy to do through all that makeup. You know, Doug Jones is very much one of these actors who, for whatever reason, is really comfortable in an absolute bucket load of makeup and really makes it work for it. You know, let's face it, Shape of Water won the Oscar last year, you know, and he was, the, you know, he was the fish guy in it. And, yeah, he, he really, really is one of those few actors who's amazing in heavy makeup. I mean, Hellboy 2's just come on Netflix, so I ended up re-watching it, and yeah, he, he knocks it out of the park as Abe Sapien as well, so... For whatever reason, he's just really, really good in heavy makeup. But, um, yeah, so let's let's talk about the actual episode. Uh, they There's another one of those weird, mysterious, red light burst things. And this time the planet it's directly over is Saru's homeworld. And we get a little bit of clarification on some of the stuff we saw in the short... Um, if you haven't watched the Saru short, it's quite an interesting little thing, basically about how he got recruited into Starfleet. Uh, you actually see a couple of small bits of it in the episode where he's talking about, um, you know, he left his village and he got picked up by, um, uh, Giorgio, who at that point was apparently not, uh, Captain Giorgio at that point. She was only, I think he says Lieutenant Giorgio, um, but I, I, you know, it could have been Lieutenant Commander, I'm not 100% certain. Uh, but yeah, and they basically reveal that the way this planet has operated is that there are two species. It's they're sort of. I'm not sure if they if the other species actually lives on the planet or if they're now sort of living in orbital habitats or something like that. But there are basically two species. There's Saru's people and this other lot who. I think he. I think they could call them the Ba'u, which reminded me a bit of the Baku from uh, Star Trek Insurrection. But anyway. Um, the, the other lot, and the other lot are significantly more technologically advanced, and they've been using it to, well, effectively harvest uh, Saru's people. You know, as soon as they reach the point at which their you know, threat ganglia start getting inflamed, um, they basically you know, send themselves off to these weird monolith-looking things for a sort of ritual sacrifice, and they're never seen again. And there was some implication that the alien species might have been eating them, uh, but in this episode, that doesn't get brought up. Now, that could just be because they're kind of dropping the whole cannibalism thing because people keep saying, for the love of God, please stop with the cannibalism stuff. Or that could be purely just didn't, you know, you know, maybe they don't actually eat them and that was just the assumption we're making. You know, maybe they do just kill them. Um, but yes, and once again, there's no sign of what actually caused this, this bright red burst of light. Uh, so Saru and Michael go down to his village, meet with his sister, and, you know, they go through the whole, you know, oh my god, you're alive, you know, what, what happened, and, you know, he reveals that he's now lost his threat ganglia, you know, and all that, and again, these are really interesting scenes, and it's, I always like seeing different cultures in Star Trek, that's what Star Trek's, Okay, I was going to say Star Trek's good at, but honestly, the problem with Star Trek is they have a bad habit of making one particular element of a culture the focus of every single member of the culture. You know, um, so all of the Ferengi are greedy buggers who only care about money. All of the Klingons are warriors with you know, and, and they have their honor and and all that stuff. You know, all of the Romulans are sneaky buggers who you know are constantly backstabbing each other and, and you know so on and so forth. So. It's always nice seeing a different culture, and this one actually feels a little bit varied, because um, 
you know, we know that uh, Saru's father was a priest, and his well, and his sister has now decided to, to become a priest as well. Um, but you know, they, they clearly have you know, gatherers and and you know the whole the whole shtick. So you know, a little bit of variation there. But their the central focus of their culture is around effectively the ritual sacrifice at the end of their life, which yeah, that makes makes sense. And as soon as the aliens realize, or the the other species realize that Saru is a Kelpian who's gone through the transformation and survived, they basically go into oh crap mode. You know, they they start panicking, and they are warp. It's implied that they're warp capable, but when the Federation try to you know introduce themselves, they basically told them to piss off. You know, which is the it's the right of any civilization. Um. There's actually an interesting bit in uh, the Orville, which, incidentally, if you're not watching the Orville, it's quite good. I would recommend it. Um, but yeah, there's a bit where they get contacted by a species that hasn't yet attained uh, spaceflight, and they basically go and they visit them. And the comment is, yeah, once once a species starts reaching out into the cosmos, it'll do it in one of two ways: it'll either invent faster than light travel, or it'll send out a signal that says, "We are here, come talk to us." And when that happens, they make contact with them. And that civilizations that suddenly find themselves realizing that they are actually, I think this might be two different episodes, but anyway, you know, that they are not alone in the universe tend to react in one of two ways. They either embrace the fact that they are part of a larger whole and try and join the collected community, or their xenophobia kicks in and they try to you know, claim that they're the most important race in the galaxy and everybody, you know, and, and the universe still revolves around them and so on and so forth. And it tends to go to one of those two extremes, and in this case, it's pretty clear that you know the, these other um, aliens. That th I'm going to go with Ba'u purely because I think that's what they kept saying, and it's clear that the Ba'u went the xenophobia route. They basically you know told Starfleet to bugger off, and that does happen sometimes. Um, you know that they have a system that works for them, and they don't want anyone interfering with it. You know, and Starfleet won't interfere. You know, again, Prime Directive, they're not supposed to interfere at the slightest. I mean, to be fair, everybody in this episode kept going, but sir, what about the Prime, Di Prime Directive? Now yeah, bollocks to it. And to be fair, yeah, that's how the Kirk era handles it. <laughs> you know, by the time of TNG, it's become full-on dogma and you get into long arguments over what's the right decision. And in the Kirk era, they just sort of go, eh. <sighs> I mean, let's face it, we all remember the uh, TOS episode with the planet of Nazis. No, seriously, there's a TOS episode with the planet of Nazis, because it turns out that a um, guy who was there to secretly study them uh, cre recreated the Nazi party there because he thought you know, that they were in some way good for that society. And yeah, it goes horrifically wrong, as you would expect. It's a weird episode. It's quite, it's an interesting episode, but it's a weird episode. Um, but yes. So... You know, Saru and his sister basically get nobbled by, um, well actually no, they escape off uh, planet, you know, back to the Discovery, and then the, the alien race contacts them and basically threatens to kill all of the Kelpians if uh, Saru isn't handed over to them, so of course Saru hands himself over, and uh, they, they then have to, you know, rescue him, and, and you know, there's some good action beats in there, and it appears Saru now has spikes, in terms of where his threat ganglia were, they mentioned near the beginning of the episode that it's growing uh, some sort of cartilage and something that looks like bone, or something that looks like uh, teeth. And it basically you know, actually comes out and sort of, you know, he, he fires some spikes forward, and I'm just thinking, that's a bit x men isn't it? But uh, yeah, that that happens. And, interest, and incidentally, I like the design for the, the Ba'u, because they're this weird... Well, okay, they're reminding me kind of of the uh, villain in Skin of Evil. You know, this sort of tar-looking monster thing. And that was quite interesting. You know, it wasn't just a dude in a, you know, in a bit of makeup or whatever. So that that was that was interesting. And, you know, again, they basically plan to completely wipe out... Or the plan they come up with is to basically transform the entire Kelpian race, which, um, yeah, that's definitely against the Prime Directive, guys. Good luck explaining this one to Starfleet. Um, but, yes, what they basically do is recreate the signal from uh, the, the the giant spherical thing, 
transmit that over the entire planet and basically kick off you know, all of the Kelpians going through the thing. I'm assuming they must have souped it up in some way, given that it took Saru at least a day to go through the whole thing, and in this episode it happens in like five minutes. Because they basically realise, or they examine the Sphere's records, and they realise that several thousand years ago, uh, the Kelpians were clearly the dominant species. And, you know, in particular these more advanced Kelpians after they've been through the, the transformation. And... Uh, so yeah, so the, the the other lot obviously gained some sort of advanced technology, or they, they invented the machine gun or whatever, and you know, managed to, to switch it around. And they instituted a policy in a society that was designed to prevent the Kelpians ever threatening them again. And that does make the entire issue kind of morally grey. But uh, yeah, so they basically kick off a revolution on this planet by transforming all of the Kelpians. You know, so they're now faster, stronger, yada yada yada, but they still have the technological inferiority. And the alien, the other Ba'u obviously cannot allow this to happen, so their solution is to destroy all the pylons, which is basically going to detonate with you know, nuclear-sized explosions or whatever. And that is the point at which you know, the, the you know, big base inside the lake rises up and you get a full James Bond moment. Um, you know, so, and they're linking all the pylons, and they're going to destroy all the pylons, and it's really, really scary and ominous. And then the angel turns up again. And this is where we get the confirmation of what I'd suspected. It's definitely a person using some sort of advanced technology. You, know, they, they, you get a better look at it here, and they confirm later what Saru says... Uh, is that it's some sort of being in some sort of technological suit. And given the high, pr you know, the presence of lots of tachyons, we're dealing with a time traveller. Which is very interesting. There's a, that, there's a lot of places you can actually go with that. And given that this thing has focused itself on Spock to a certain extent, there is a suggestion that it's probably somebody who has a personal connection to Spock in some way. Which does give us interesting options. Um, so, you know, one of the potential options is it's um, somebody we, we you know, knew from TOS who's, who's travelled back in time. You know, so, uh, you know, my uh, father's immediate comment was, it's probably Kirk. You know, let's face it, there's a reason why Kirk has such a large file in the uh, offices of the Temporal Investigation people. Um, but no, I don't think it's Kirk, because, uh, okay, it might be Kirk, it's probably not Kirk. Um, you know, it could be any other member of the Enterprise crew, it could be somebody from the TNG era who met him, that's a distinct possibility. Um, it could just be somebody who's trying to preserve the timeline in some way, you know, maybe there's somebody else screwing with it, so he, so this person in the suit has come back. Um, or it's Michael. There's like a 60% chance that it's going to turn out to be future Michael in that suit. Um, you know, or the furthest point of, of time travel technology we've seen... I don't know, is it Enterprise or is it Relativity? It's probably Enterprise, I think, is the highest level of time travel technology we've seen. But we also see in Voyager, there's an episode about that features a, a Federation time ship called the Relativity, which has temporal transporters and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, you know, so there could be something to do with that, or they could just be doing completely their own thing. You know, maybe it's an alien race who has time travel technology. But yeah, so that is clearly where they're going with that. It's going, you know... It's going to... The person in that suit, I maintain, is going to be somebody we know. Now, the question is whether it's somebody we know from this show or somebody we know from one of the other Star Trek shows. And both are distinct possibilities. You know, because, let's face it, they've got a bunch of the old Star Trek uh, regulars doing directing gigs. So if they wanted to be able to bring in one of them sneakily... And have them return to play their character, they could, you know, and nobody would notice because, you know, as I say, we've had episodes directed by uh, Jonathan Frakes, Robert Duncan McNeil, um, you know, and a whole that you know, about half the uh, 
cast of, of Star Trek has in some way done directing work. So they could bring in one of those people claiming they're directing an episode and then also have them appear as their previous character. You know, LeVar Burton does an awful lot of directing work. Um, uh, Roxanne Dawes does a lot of directing work. You know, because uh, she actually directed a, a few episodes of Enterprise. And, he, and again, one of the episodes she directed, she also provided the voice of a computer in, in that story. So there is precedent for this. So that's a possibility. Or, as I say, it could well be somebody from the show Discovery. You know, it could be... Okay, spitballing. Maybe it's Lorca. As, you know, maybe it's Prime Universe Lorca or something like that. They want to bring him back. So the thing is, there are so many potentially interesting ways they can go with this, and I'm still like eighty percent sure it's going to turn out to be Michael. <laughs> yeah, that there, there's a lot of potential here, and I genuinely don't know where they're going to go with it. Which, to be fair, the fact I don't know, I actually find quite interesting. Um, but. Yeah, so we are dealing with a time traveller, is, is the Red Angel, and yeah, that, again, it's kind of hard to talk a lot about this episode, because I'm, a lot of the stuff about it that really works is the emotional stuff between Saru and his sister, and I can't really delve into that really well just beyond saying that, you know, Doug Jones is knocking it out of the park. So, yeah, overall it's a... It's a good episode. It sets up some interesting stuff for the future, and I'm curious to know where they go with it. Uh, the only weak spots in the episode are the interactions between um, Ash and uh, Pike, because I still don't care about Ash. Also, the beard does not suit him. I, I don't know what it is, but that beard is... is yeah, trim it back a little bit. Trim it back a little. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's just something off-putting about it to me. I'm not... I have no idea what it is. It's just it doesn't look quite right somehow, especially not now he's back in a you know, Starfleet uniform. Um, you know, because I think that's probably the biggest beard we've ever seen on a Starfleet character. <laughs> uh, actually, I think it pretty much is. Yeah, you know, unless we've had an alien race in the past with sort of massive beards, but uh, don't remember that specifically. But yeah, so as I, said, I found those scenes to be the weak points of the episode. Um, because, you know, Pike clearly does not trust Ash in the slightest. Which, yeah, you can kind of understand that. And, you know, there's there's a bit of conflict there, but it just wasn't... wasn't particularly interesting conflict, I didn't feel. Um, you know, and, uh, so, yeah. But no, it was okay. It Again, it was a really good episode with a B-plot I didn't really find very interesting. But, you know, again, we are talking about three or four scenes throughout the entire episode, so maybe that maybe that was the problem. There was so much other stuff going on that when they cut away to it to something that was relatively unimportant, uh, it just, it felt, you know, it, it was the epitome of stop distracting me with this boring stuff, get back to the interesting thing. So maybe that was it. But yeah, Something about those scenes just just didn't grab me, but the rest of the episode I thought was a, was a really good episode. So, uh, yeah, so that's it for this one, and you know, we're we're heading off into well the the yeah again I don't know how many episodes this season's gonna be because the last one was thirteen fourteen or was it fifteen I think it was fifteen in the last season actually. So I have absolutely no idea how many episodes we're getting this season, but we'll get what we get. And, uh, yeah, overall, I'm looking forward to the rest of the season. As I said, I'm calling my prediction now. I want somebody interesting to be in the, in, uh, the Red Angel suit, but it's probably Michael. <laughs>